I try to always look <clears throat> at my product the way my customers do. Uh -huh. <clears throat> you know, I tell the guys out in the shop all the time. I said, look, <clears throat> if you were buying this, just think about it, if you were buying, because they'll say, man, we could shorten it up if we did this or that. And a lot of times they have good ideas, and sometimes I particularly don't care for it. And the best way I can explain to them, because the first thing somebody, when they work in, out in the, they were in the shop, they don't want to get shot down. I want them to come up with new ideas. Sure. But if, if I always end it like, if you were buying this, would you do it? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they can't ever argue with that. And it makes them proud in what they do also. Sure. And I want them to be. I mean, I, we have the best product out there. And yeah. the only reason I do is because of them guys out in the shop. Right. You know, your product's only as good as who builds it. The Converse Cowboy Journey has given me an opportunity to sit down with some amazing performers that are living the Western lifestyle. Or it is my job to tease out their habits and routines so that you can apply and test yourself in your own life. I've learned, I've grown personally, I've been enlightened, and I've been humbled. Above all, I realize that there is no destination in this life no goal achieved or money made that can replace the feeling of flow and the pursuit of doing what you love to do. With a growth mindset, I'm constantly asking questions and pursuing knowledge. The Converse Cowboy is a platform that allows me to do just that. I'm excited and eager to share their stories with you all. I'm Mike Roberts, this is the Converse Cowboy. Brought to you by Kerry Kelly Bits and Spurs and Schaefer Outfitter. Mr. Larry Roberts, owner of Western Hauler. Um, glad to have you on the show today. We're down here in the stockyards again at Schaefer Outfitter, and um, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing your story, hearing your journey. Um, I'm, I think you're the first guest that we've had on that is from Louisiana. Yes, I am. Born and raised, and so we'll start there. And um, how did you get from Louisiana over here to the Fort Worth area? What was it that brought you over this way? <clears throat> well, I'm gonna tell you, it's probably a, a girl. <laughs> More than anything, you know, I'm, uh, I was born and raised in southeast Louisiana, St. Bernard Parish. Uh, grew up on a cattle ranch and uh, got real fortunate. And the guy that I was working for at the time, he wanted to get into the show horses. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so uh, he wanted to get into halter horses. So he, <clears throat> being that I grew up on a ranch and we had cow ponies, he thought I knew about a halter horse. I didn't know nothing about a halter horse. <laughs> I mean, it's a different world, right? A totally different world. Yeah. Totally different world. Well, thank goodness he sent me to work with a guy that was a very prominent halter horse trainer down there. And uh, I worked with him for about, oh, I guess, six to eight months. Mm -hmm. Wasn't nothing to it. It was a lot easier being a, it was a lot easier brushing and fitting a halter horse than it was taking care of a bunch of cows. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I figured, you know, I could do this. Well, make a long story short, <clears throat> we had some really nice horses, started showing, and uh, was winning quite a bit. How old were you? How old were you At when you that made that time, move? At that time, let's see, that was in 85, so I was 22. Okay. And uh, went to a horse show. Back then, this would have been in 1986. Went to a horse show in Dothan, Alabama. It was the Wiregrass Circuit, big quarter horse circuit. And... Um, <clears throat> Met this gal from Texas, <laughs> and uh, her name happened to be Melody Bell, and uh, her dad, actually, I know earlier you said I'm the owner of Western Hauler, but he, he started Western Hauler. Okay. My father-in-law, his name is Wayne Bell, and uh, still I'm very active in the business today. Okay. Uh, I pick, we live on the same ranch. I pick him up in the morning at 6.20, and I better not be late. And we go into town to Burleson, we have coffee and breakfast every morning, read the paper, talk about what we're gonna do, ride to town together, yeah. work together all day long. My wife gets there about 10 o'clock, she's yeah. the bookkeeper, and uh, takes care of the money, stays on me about collecting money. <laughs> I love it, I love it. So what year did he start it then? He started Western Hall in 1982. Okay. In 82, so it was active about six years, about, you know, five, six years before I got involved in it. I got you. And um, <clears throat> actually, he hired me not to not to do the trucks, but uh, he hired me to come uh, run the ranch. Okay. At the time, he had, uh, he had three studs. Uh, you can relate to this, being a cutter. <clears throat> um, it was actually about a way of the cutting horse fraternity in 1986 that he hired me. I got you. <clears throat> there was a horse called, um, what was his name? Jody rode him. His sire was Brinks Royal Lee. 
Roll Silver King. Okay. Jody Gain won the fraternity on Roll Silver King. And at the fraternity, at the time, we used to give away the year's use of a Western hauler to the winner of the fraternity. Mm. So Wayne was there to give the truck away to Jody because he won it. Well, the group of guys that owned the sire of the horse Jody just won the fraternity on, they knew they were going to have a lot of breedings. Mm. So they wanted to stand the horse at a nice place. They made a deal with my father-in-law. <clears throat> we want you to stand the horse at the ranch in Burleson. Wayne called me next night. I need you to come to work for me. I'm going to breed a lot of mares, and I need to. At the time, Mike, I did not want to leave. I was very content where I was. I worked for a great guy, had some really good halter horses, was winning. And Melody and I, at the time, we were just dating. I see. You know, we weren't real serious. You know, I'm, I'm sure she was seeing other people. I was seeing other people. We weren't real serious. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I told Wayne that. I said, you know, if I do decide to come, that's probably the most negative reason is your daughter. If it doesn't work out, I'm going to be a bad guy. Every time <laughs> right. she comes home, she's going, why is he here? You know? Right. But make a long story short, <clears throat> I took the job. We bred, uh, I think we bred on uh, almost 100 mares to Brinks that year. You know? Really? And uh, that's, pro that's the one and only cutting horse I've ever rode. Mike. I used <laughs> no to, kidding. Yeah. I used, to get, I used to get one of my buddy, we'd cut, I'd cut people on him. <laughs> you know, you'd run across back and forth across the arena and Brinks yeah. was a neat old horse yeah yeah and that's an experience I think everybody should do at least once oh I'm gonna tell you, you even, if, it, even if it's a person <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, even if it's a person well he must have seen something in you though um to offer a job to you for you to come work at his place I'm curious to know what was it because you're saying you're 22 years old at that time like what was it you think that made him trust your ability to come run this ranch you know I'm not one to you know most people that you know uh, Wayne Bell is probably you know we got a really neat relationship <clears throat> we're my father-in-law I'm his son-in-law we're business partners and we're best friends too <clears throat> I mean we talk about anything and everything um, special guy mm -hmm. and I've got to give it to him Mike I mean he is one of the most wise he's taught me more in life than anybody ever has yeah. and uh, you know I I've always been the kind of person I mean you're from Louisiana I think we're special people from down there yeah take that in many different ways but yeah we are you know, special you know it's one thing we do you know if we're gonna tell somebody we're gonna do something we do it yeah you know, and I think Wayne just figured out. He figured that out on his own. I know? see. I'm no different today than I was back then. I had yeah. I had a lot of the horse industry just intrigued me. I loved it. Yeah. And actually, I didn't do a lot of breeding in South Louisiana. I was mostly fitting and showing halter horses. I see. We had some brood mares, but I wasn't. We sent the mares to get bred. Right. And I explained that to Wayne, and. Um, he said, I, I got faith in you. You can learn. And as a veterinarian, and he, was, he used to be an active cutter. He's retired now. He was a veterinarian from Burleson, Harold Putnam. And uh, he was actually part owners in Brinks Rolle in the stud horse. I see. And uh, Putt was the, the vet that did all the breeding. And I'll never forget the first time he showed up. <clears throat> I said, Dr. Putnam, I said, you're going to tell me what you want me to do. I said, he, and he said, well, Wayne said... You'd learn fast. So <clears throat> I'm going back to your question. You asked me, why did he? It was all, it was all Wayne Bell. Mm. You know, it was all him. He said I could handle it. And, and uh, you know, Dr. Putnam is at the cafe that I take Wayne to every morning. We right. call it, it's, it's the old folks' home, <laughs> the little Burleson Cafe. And uh, there's not a week goes by that Putt doesn't tell me. He says, you know, you're the fastest learner I've ever seen. He said, you know, out of those 90-something mare, <clears throat> mares that we bred that year, I think we only got one or two that didn't take. Right on. You know? And back then was the day, it was really before, we didn't AI. We live covered, live covered some. He AI'd some. But uh, I teased him with a little teasing stud every day hmm. and didn't know a thing about it. But you know what? <laughs> Anything you do in life, if you apply yourself and you love it, you're going to succeed. 
Mm. So you, yeah, you got to love what you're going to do. You do. You got to like it. Right. You got to like it. Right. And then it just kind of works itself out. It right? worked itself out. I did the horses um, for Wayne for two years. What was it that he said that finally convinced you to make the move? You know, he called me three or four times in a row at night. And um, my father-in-law, if anybody knows him, probably the worst thing he would he likes to be told is no. He doesn't accept no very well. And uh, I told him no three times in a row when he tried to hire me. And knowing him now, that probably secured the job from better than anything. <laughs> yeah, because he does not he does not accept no. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like I said earlier, the man that I was working for was a very instrumental in my life also. His name was Pat Pesquet, and he was in the crew boat business. And he got involved in the horses, and he had a lot of faith in me. I guess I've been very fortunate, or, or I've, I've portrayed goodness in my life so far. Um, I've had two instances in my life that go back to a question you ask. And I'm going to tell you, Mike, I, I've never thought of, thought of this before. You, you're making me think of things that make me even feel even more fortunate in my life. You said, what did Wayne see in you? You know, what did Mr. Pat see in me? <clears throat> never knew a thing about a halter horse. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm going to get in a halter. And he got in a big way. I mean, he built a big barn, spent a lot of money on marriage. Right. And, uh, he put a lot of trust in me too for someone that never showed a halt to horse ever. Right. Isn't that interesting how things play out? It is. It is. You and may I, not know why at the time, but I never thought about it before. You you've added something to my life. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Yeah. Right on. So let's back up a little bit. How where did that passion for horses come from? Like we were talking a little bit before these cameras got cut on, you know, it sounded like um, you were the only one of your friends that were wearing cowboy hats and into this this horse thing. So where did that stem from? You know, I guess I come from a family. I've got I've got a sister and three brothers, and we all grew up the same way. Grew up on a cattle ranch. Uh, I used to have to milk a cow before school every day. <clears throat> we had a milk we had two milk cows for the house. Yeah, right. On. And uh, I was the oldest of all five. And it's funny how families, you know, we got five kids that all grew up the same way, same household. Not that they didn't <clears throat> work with the cattle and, per, you know, partake in all the chores and everything, but I guess I'm the only one that really had a passion for it, that really liked it. Right. You know, I mean, I tried, I tried my hand at riding bulls for a little while wasn't any good at it so i decided well, you walked in here pretty good though so you yeah, must not have got beat up too not bad. too bad not too bad i got I, I didn't do it long enough <laughs> you know to get hurt i guess i was fortunate yeah. but none of them ever did any of that i think it's just something that it just clicks in you i mean my dad was you know my grandfather was still alive at that time when i was in louisiana and and he was in the cattle business and he had eight kids and my dad was the only one out of them eight that followed through with the livestock. And today, I'm the only one in, the, I guess, the whole Roberts clan that's still involved with livestock. I got you. Know, you. A lot of my aunts and my uncles and their kids that are, that are alive, you know, yeah. I'm the only one that's still active. So I, I guess um, the livestock industry, you got to be a special person to, to continue with it. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, because it gets narrowed down more and more. But thank goodness there's still there's lots of us that have that interest. Yeah, right. I was very similar. I, I grew up and my grandparents had a farm and they had a few horses. N didn't really know horsemanship or anything like that. But I can just remember like riding that first Shetland pony and like it just kind of got in my blood, you know, and uh, always. But, but I grew up playing sports throughout high mm -hmm. school and college and mm -hmm. um but it was always there, like this passion for horses, you know, but I never was exposed to it until, I don't know, I was probably 30, I guess. I had some friends that were team ropers, and once I got into it, it was like I'm addicked. Yeah. <laughs> you know? once, you, once, you hooked, once you hooked on a horse, you, you, yeah. you, it's for life. Yeah. It's and, for life. And the team roping thing led into working cow, and the working cow led into this cutting thing. And again, I'm an amateur at best, mm -hmm. you know, but, I, but I, it's something I love. And that's where I go. I go to the horses like when I need to get away or I feel overwhelmed or, you know, it's almost like a meditation for me just to kind of go ride through my place. So it, it is, it is. It's a, it's a big relaxation. I, my wife says my relaxation must be, you know, when I was growing up in South, Southeast Louisiana, I mowed, I guess we had, we run a lot of cattle on the marsh. 
Well, naturally, oh, yeah. it didn't take any upkeep. But on the high ground, we had about, about 350 acres of high ground where we kept the cattle in the wintertime during hurricane season. We'd had to be mowed. I remember mowing that whole place on an open, open tractor with a little five-foot bush hog. And I always dreamed one day I'd be on that tractor for three or four days straight. Boy, it'd be nice to have a cab tractor. Well, that's one thing if my dad and my grandfather was still alive, the first thing I'd show them when they come to the ranch is my cab tractor. <laughs> <laughs> I understand what you mean. <laughs> you know, it's a cab tractor. That, yeah. It's amazing how things that you uh, dream about when you're young that you that actually you get when you get older. It's, it makes you realize how fortunate you are. Yeah, right? You know? The little things. The little bitty things. Um, this has nothing to do with horses, but I, I'd like to, so you're, you're from South Louisiana, I'm from North Louisiana, um, so you're gonna know what I'm talking about, but when I tell people I'm from Louisiana, they're like, oh, New Orleans, or, oh, Baton mm -hmm. Rouge, and I'm like, no, 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 there is a difference. North Louisiana should almost be part of Texas, like the accents are different, the food's different, the landscape's different. Totally. <laughs> yeah, totally. So, and then in South Louisiana, I'll let you describe what South Louisiana is you about. Know, South Louisiana is really unique. And you were describing different parts of Louisiana have their own uniqueness. Yeah. You know, I mean, when you say South Louisiana, first thing most people that don't know Louisiana, when you say South Louisiana, they think about Lafayette. Mm. You know, they think about Cajun country. Yeah. You know, um, we're not Cajuns where I'm from. I don't know if I can really say what they call us down <laughs> yeah. there, but we have our own terminology and it's not anything negative. Right. It's just Cajuns were a certain ethnic group that settled. They were French descent in that middle southern Louisiana. Southeast Louisiana, and it is close to New Orleans. I mean, the parish I grew up in is a neighboring parish to New Orleans, yeah. to the city. It was settled by a lot of different ethnic groups. So it's kind of like a bowl of gumbo. It's a little yeah, bit of everything. Yeah. Well, the accent is a little bit of everything. You know, the Lafayette has their own accent. Southeast Louisiana, where I'm from, we have our own accent. I don't judge my accent. I've been here too I long. I can hear the cage. I can hear it in there. Yeah. I, I, and I'm sure when you go back home, oh, it sure enough comes out. Mike, when I go back home and I come back to Texas, yeah. all the guys at the shop, they know. <laughs> oh, you've been back home. You know, because I'll, I'll get it right back. Yeah. I lived in Thibodeau for a little bit. That's where I went to school, down at Nickel State. Mm -hmm. And that's sure enough, Cajun country. Yes, it know, is. I kind of picked up that accent just from being around it while I was down there. It's since left me, but um, great times, great food, great people. You know, yeah. they, that's that. It's one thing you'll find in South Louisiana. Those people know how to have fun. Oh yeah, yeah, they do. They do. Yeah. They, you know, they kind of made their own entertainment and it stuck with them. Yeah. You know, and family means everything. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we used to say when I was a, when I was a kid, I I was in 4-H. <clears throat> that's big in Louisiana, mm -hmm. and if uh, I always used to show steers. So I automatically got to go to 4-H camp. And that was um, around at Fort Grant. It was around like Alexandria. And uh, I remember my grandpa and my dad said, oh, you're going to be close to Yankee land. They used to say anything above Alexandria. That's the cutoff. Was, was Yankee. <laughs> yeah. You know, the Alexandria cutoff. was the cutoff. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so you're, you're, you, you move over to Texas. You're doing this ranch thing. Talk about the transition. How did that conversation go like? the transition to Western Hauler and showing up there every day and you know and doing that. It, it was a uh, it's a really it's a funny story you know it, you know the best part about this so far and I know we're not even done but it's bringing up all good memories oh that's awesome you know you're going back going through history I'll never forget I was working at the ranch and um, we we only bred brinks that one year you know and then after that next year I think that it was a group of guys owned him and then they ended up selling him so he went, Brinks was gone. But at the time, I didn't tell you earlier, my father-in-law had three studs himself. He had two halter horse studs and a pleasure horse stud. So I was actually <clears throat> breeding four. <clears throat> wow. Yeah, I was breeding four studs that year. But Brinks obviously had the most. They were all outside mares. All the other, the other studs were breeding Wayne's mares. When I first moved there, he had a big operation. He had, he had about 30 brood mares himself. It was a big, big operation. Mm -hmm. But uh, we got married. <clears throat> um, my biggest fears of going to Texas was her. Ended up being the biggest joy. Yeah, that's you know, awesome. You know, it ended up being the biggest joy. And I think I keep going back to what you said earlier about well, wh why did what did Wayne see in you? Why do you? 
I'm, I'm, if, if he was here today, he'd probably tell you, well, I want to get a son-in-law too, mm. you know? And mm -hmm. um, at the time, <clears throat> Melly and I got married, and it wasn't very long after that. We will never forget, we were going to a guy that's very, very successful in the halt horse business. We were going to Jim Snow's in Quinlan, Texas. Wayne was driving a pickup, <clears throat> and I was in the passenger seat. It was just him and I. And he says, Larry, I need to talk to you. And I'm thinking, oh, something did something wrong. <clears throat> he said, you know, you're married. You're part of family now. I said, yes, sir. He goes, I'm going to give you a choice, and it's yours. You make the decision. He goes, you can have the ranch. He says, I'll supply you with a truck and trailer to go to the horse shows, <clears throat> but the horse deal would be, would be yours. He said, outside horses are fitting, that'd be your business. He said, take care of my horses, we'll work something out. Or you can come to town and learn truck business. Out of respect for my wife, <clears throat> I knew what I wanted to do, right? At that second. Out of respect for my wife, I said, well, you mind if I go home tonight and talk to Melody about it? <clears throat> he said, no problem. So I talked to her about it, and she said, what do you want to do? <clears throat> I said, I, I'd like to learn truck business. I said, you know, the horse deal, I, I was very fortunate. I was successful in it. And I said, you know, I can always do the horses. <clears throat> horses would always be there. I can still show and do the trucks. So that's, that's when I went to Western Holler. <clears throat> and that would have been? Was, that was in 80, that was, that would have been 80, 89. My brother-in-law was part of the business and I had actually went to the Congress with him and helped him at the Congress while I was still at the ranch. So I kind of had an idea what the truck business was going to be like before I accepted the, <clears throat> the new challenge. Right. So we'll touch on this just for a second for listeners that may not know what Western Hauler is or may, you know, may not be in this Western lifestyle and have never heard of it. Can you explain what Western Hauler is exactly? Western Hauler is we <clears throat> take a stock truck, <clears throat> let's just use for example a, a Ford, uh, Lariat F-350 and we'll upgrade it we'll um, like in the horse industry a big big deal that big one of our biggest sellers are extra fuel tanks and uh, we'll put extra fuel tank 94 gallon tanks you don't have to stop as often uh, we'll put airbags underneath it with compressors for carrying capacity we put gooseneck hitches in and then we go even farther <clears throat> for the person that wants a really unique truck We'll do uh, alligator, ostrich inserts in the seats. Uh, we'll put wood inside of them. Um, we've got a lot of equipment. We make all our own wood. We have a CNC machine where we cut out extra wood to go on the inside. We take the factory plastics out and then we, uh, we hydro dip it to match <clears throat> our wood that we put in. On our seats, we had to get real creative lately because they got air conditioning now. So we had to come up with a machine to perf this stuff mm. so that air conditioning could come through. But we just fully customize, we'll customize the truck to your specifications. Mm. You know, do custom paint jobs. Uh, uh, really neat story is the way Western Hauler started. <clears throat> Gosh, this would have been, I really don't know what year, but my father-in-law, Wayne Bell, has always b had his own business. He was in the automotive and tire business. He was in the detailing business. So he's always had a business that's been around automotive. Well, he bought a horse, <clears throat> and he wanted to get in the racehorse business, and he bought a horse, and he thought it was going to be a good racehorse. Well, he couldn't run. He didn't know what he was going to do, and he gave a bunch of money for this horse. Like what he says, it was everything he had at the time. Well, some guy told him, he said, you're going to take that horse to the horse show. And he happened to be a registered quarter horse. And I believe, I believe Wayne bought him out in Rio Dosa okay. at the All-American sale. Yeah. And uh, so he gave a little money for him. And uh, so he took him to a quarter horse show. And he was, I think, and I hope I'm saying this story right. Wayne, Wayne was here, he could tell you. He didn't win, but he was, boy, he was just close enough to give him the, <clears throat> draw him in, you know. Yeah him that tease so he went back home did his homework and ended up winning and ended up being a big time horse well Wayne's always liked to tinker <clears throat> and um, Western Holler actually started <clears throat> at the ranch we've got a big shop and it actually started that he started building and tinkering on the trucks at night really he didn't do it in town he was in a head automotive business and a tire business and um, 
He put chrome wheels on them, do a little, have somebody do a paint job on them. Now, being in our mode business, he had a record. And he went to a horse show one time, and back then, most horse shows were riding clubs putting them on, so they were held outside. What was that old facility in Monroe? I used to go to court horse shows. It was outside by the university somewhere, but it was an outdoor pen. Where'd that be at? Yeah. Oh, um, shit. I don't know what you're talking about. It's over there. It was Ray's PG's around yeah, there about yeah, then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right over that bridge. I don't yeah. I don't know the name of it, but I know where you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, we've been acquired. And, you know, you, you go through, they had low spots, high spots. Well, back then, horse trailers, you didn't have adjustable noses. They were all permanently, they were just welded. Yeah. You couldn't adjust them. He went to a low spot, <clears throat> and the trailer crunched the top of the bed. <clears throat> Wayne's a doodler. He's always, all, all during the day, he's doodling on his pad on his desk. We well, had a record, and he got to doodling, and um, he took the A-frame off the record and kind of designed the trough. Well, he called a record guy that built records and had him build him a not knowing he would be the world's first Western hauler body. Mm. <clears throat> so he built one, <clears throat> fixed it up, put chrome wheels on it, did a paint job, did a little interior work, made it nice, went to a quarter horse show because he had him a horse, he was beating everybody. Mm. <clears throat> a guy from Louisiana, he was president at AQHA at one time. His name was J.D. Blondin. <clears throat> I don't know if you ever heard of him, I haven't, no but sure. he's from Acadia. Okay. And J.D. saw the truck, <clears throat> Said, hey, how much for that truck? So Wayne sold it to him. Built another one, another top guy in the quarter horse deal, Larry Sullivan. Wayne, I won't buy that truck. The birth of Western Hauler. That's awesome. It's amazing how that how it started. Necessity. The, yeah. Right? On the whim of a trailer crunched on top of a bed. Yeah. Well, when I got involved in it <clears throat> in 89, he still had West Side Service. That was his automotive and tire store. And it was a small part of West Side Service, still active. But since then, Western Hauler took over everything. It's just Western Hauler now. Yeah. That's an amazing story. And, and we sat down with Randy Bloomer yesterday, and that seems very similar. Like his deal got started out of necessity, mm -hmm. you know, and, and what he's developing now. Um, it's very impressive to see and, and, and just to have that vision and to be able to put that into action. Is, is something, I don't know, I don't think um, a lot of people are doing. You know, that idea may sit there, but the fact that they took action and did something, and then the other people get the benefit of it. Exactly. Right. Well, I, you know, we, we go back, we keep going back to your very first question, Mike. Yes, sir. <clears throat> you know, what did he say in you? Yeah. And I don't know if you can tell by our conversation so far, but Wayne is like, <clears throat> very important person to me and I oh, think yeah. the world of him and I keep going back to him I mean he had a vision about me mm -hmm. he had a vision about Western Hauler I mean yeah. the guy he's a he's a walking living legend yeah. you know he's 82 years old and still is very active in the business give me the tell me this um I think that's so important to surround ourselves with people like mm -hmm. that and so what is, do you have any nuggets um, for, for listeners that may be out there, something that you learned from him um, as it relates to business, as it relates to life? Like, is there any mantras or quotes that really stick out in your head? You know, go for it. I mean, that, that's the main thing. If you go for it, got an idea, that idea can sit in your head all at once. Until you actually put it out there and try it, you're never going to know if it's going to work. Right. I mean, and I think I think a lot of the difference between people that have been very successful and people that, and not that they're not successful, but they could pursue their dream a little bit more is just try that idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not going to know unless you try. And and if it doesn't work, it doesn't mean you're a failure. I mean, we've all done, including Wayne, including myself, we've done things that didn't work. Yeah. I mean, at the shop, we're trying things all the time. You know, we. The manufacturers, the biggest battle we have is manufacturers see what we've done and they start putting that from the factory that way. Mm. Um, gosh, I can't remember the year it was. Probably the, one of the most uh, very proud moment <clears throat> for me was in, at the Congress, which is a big show that the quarters have. And you, it's a big trade show. <clears throat> and... Um, we started, back when they Ford started, first started building the 450s, they made them in a chassis only. 
And there were a lot of people that couldn't afford a Western hauler bid, but they wanted a dually bid. Well, we were getting a lot of pull-off bids off of 350s. And those bids don't bring a whole lot. They bring what the tailgate's worth. Right. So we try to think, man, how can we market this bid? Well, a chassis <clears throat> and a regular dually bid has four inches difference in the frame length. So if you put a, a dually bed on a ch on a chassis, you're going to have a gap. Well, we we went, we built our own running boards, so we have a fiberglass shop <clears throat> that we and uh, we thought, well, let's make a filler panel. <clears throat> let's make a four inch filler panel, and we'll mold it the same looks of the bed, and it's be inexpensive to do because you just we just attach it to the front of the bed. So we started making 450s with dually bits. Put this filler panel on them. We had a, you know, we put factory bumpers on the back. They looked factory. Well, Ford must have heard about this and they sent, and I got to meet the guy, very nice guy. He introduced himself to me, gave me his card, told him why he was there, that they had heard about this company that was putting these dually beds on these 450s. And he had the whole, he had about five or six of the design team there at the Congress, crawled underneath the truck, looked at everything we did, and uh, two years later, Ford started putting dually beds on the 450s. No shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that's interesting to me, and, I'm, and I'd love to hear your thoughts and how you guys continue to improve, like, over the years. How do you continue to come up with new designs, new styles? You know, to, to further customize these vehicles. You know, what we've always tried to do, and <clears throat> i got to give Wayne credit for that, is we, we, well, I don't know if you, you remember the old J.C. Whitney catalog? No, sir. Okay, this is, I'm, I'm older than you. <laughs> J.C. Whitney was a catalog where you could buy stuff that was made in China before you knew it was made in China. Okay. And it was real inexpensive stuff. And uh, we try not to J.C. Whitney up the trucks. I guess It's kind of our terminology we use. We want to, when someone looks at one of our Western hauler trucks, we take a lot of pride that they can't tell if factory did it or we did it. Mm. We want what we do to complement what Ford did, what Chevrolet did, what Ram does. We want to complement what they, we're not in competition with them. We need them to sell our product. Right. And, you know, so we want right. them to have good products. Um, I think one thing today, while we're so fortunate and while we're so busy, is all the manufacturers have a good product right now. Mm -hmm. You know, years ago, back in the 90s and the early 2000s, you know, <clears throat> Ford had the best diesel motor. You know, then Dodge came out with a motor. And, and it's really not good when one company has the best product and the other one doesn't. It kind of cuts down your buying market. So it's good when all three have a good product, and they all do right now. It, it right. makes everyone happy. So we try to complement what the factory does, and naturally we got to try to figure out to do it for a price margin that's not going to just go sky high, you know, because right. trucks are getting higher and higher every year. You know, I can remember when I first started, when I went to the Congress <clears throat> in 88, 89, I was selling dually bed conversions. And when I say dually bed conversions, so you understand, we call them, we either have a Western hauler body or the factory dually bed. Okay. And naturally, the Western hauler body increases the price because it's a custom bed. Right. But a dually bed conversion with seats and wood and fuel tank, and back then it was aluminum running boards, we were selling those trucks, and I grant you, we had to get them hauled 1,100 miles to Columbus, Ohio. But we were selling them for twenty-four five, damn. Yeah, twenty-four thousand five hundred dollars. So that shows you how expensive the trucks are. Now we're starting with a truck that before we start with it, it's seventy to eighty thousand. Right. You know, before we put the first piece of Western hauler on it. Yeah. Talk about that right now. You know, with uh, it's got to do with COVID, and you drive by a car lot today, and you don't see no. much inventory on the lot. <clears throat> What's going on with that, and do you see that changing anytime soon? You know, it's been, and I, I say it probably 20 or 30 times a day, people that call. It's the strangest times I've ever seen in the, in the truck business, and right. Wayne says the same thing. <clears throat> we've, we've got plenty of demand <clears throat> and not enough product. 
So it makes it very, very difficult. I've got customers, I got a really good customer friend. He came by the shop yesterday. He's in town for the app, uh, paint world right now. And he goes, hey, so-and-so wants to give me a lot of money for my used truck. I said, yeah, you're right. He goes, okay, I need you now. I can get a lot of money. Can you get me a truck? I said, I can't find one right now. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like anything. If somebody offers you the world, it doesn't do any good if you can't replace it. Yeah, you got to go buy it. Exactly. Go out and get another one. You know, and uh, trucks are bringing more money than they ever have. We we're not we're not doing that at our at Western Hauler. If I can get my trucks, I'm still selling them what we sold them for before all of this started, because you know it's going to end. Mm -hmm. It's going to end hopefully sooner than later, and we we don't want to. We're we're not taking advantage of the situation. Yeah. Which which we're a little different, and and I shouldn't say it like that, Mike. I should that, that I misworded that what I just said. You know, the dealers are not taking advantage. You know, if a dealer, you know, they've got to still make a living, and if they're only going to get twenty trucks versus two hundred, they got to make more money. Right. You know, so that's that's an unfair. I should not have said what I said, but we we are lucky. We've been getting. Not as many as I need, but it, we, we, we're getting enough to, to keep us going. Keep how many? Going. Yeah, so how many are y'all selling a month right now? You know, I'm at the longest production period we've ever had since Western Hauler, since we've Western Hauler started. Yeah. You know, we've got a lot of work. We're very fortunate. Not only do we, we don't not only build what we sell, but we, uh, we've been involved with the manufacturers for so long. All the manufacturers, we have what you call a dropship number. So let's say you're in Monroe and you go to your local dealer, you want to do business with your local dealer, you can order it from them and they can give the manufacturer our dropship code and they'll deliver it to us for no charge. Uh, right. So I'm still getting vehicles that way. Uh, we got a big, we, we build a lot of big trucks, freight liners for a company and I've got a lot of those to build for them. Gotcha. And uh, like uh, I got six Chevrolets in last week mm -hmm. and um, they're all sold. Where normally, you know, it might take a couple weeks to sell them. Yeah. So it's, uh, production is still really, really good. We got a lot to do. Um, how many folks do you guys have working over at Western Hall right you know, now? The biggest, when people, when I go to horse shows, I go work to Congress, the world show, or go work a show, a lot of people, you know, they, they would say, can I come pick it up? We want to come see, we're going to come see Western Hall. I say, sure, we'll pick you up at the airport. And we've heard this probably more than they, where, where, where's the other factory? Because Western Hall is not as big as most people think. Because when they go to a horse show, 95% of a converted truck, if it's had conversion, it's gonna have Western Hall name on it. Right. Well, it's a little misleading. You know, you go to, you go to the, the Congress, or you go to Arizona Sun Country Circuit, all these nice fancy trucks have our name on it. Well, they come to the shop and they say, there's no way all them trucks come from here. Everyone come from right here. I've got I've got 15 of the best employees that you can find. <clears throat> this is what I've got. We do um, we do all our own prepping, all our own painting. We yeah. do everything in house. You know that's the only way to keep quality. Keep yeah, the quality. Yeah, it's up. so important. It's very. It, very important. You know, you, you talked earlier. You had Randy in here, and Randy is, gosh, he's in the he's quality. That's that's what it's all about. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems like anybody that I sit down with who is successful for an extended period of time, that seems to be the focus. Yes, quality first. And yeah. that that may sound cheesy. It may sound very vanilla, very generic, but. It, like it, it, it can be that simple. You focus on quality and everything else kind of takes care of itself. One thing you got to remember in the equine industry, <clears throat> you know, you're cutting down, doing some, some showing. One thing you always have to remember, <clears throat> and Wayne's instilled this to me and preaches to me all the time. He says, Larry, you got to understand. <clears throat> this is what these people do for enjoyment. <clears throat> you work all week long so you can go to a horse show. The last thing you want to do is go buy some and it being not the best you can buy. You know, if you're going to yeah. go buy some spurs or a bit, that horse means a lot to you. You want to buy the best you can possibly buy. A saddle, trailer's the same way, a truck's the same way. You know, 
Wayne and I go to horse shows on the weekends. That's our enjoyment. Last thing I want is an angry customer when I'm trying to enjoy myself. <laughs> so I tell the guys in the shop all the time, I say, look guys, don't y'all, y'all build this, take your time, do it right. I'm not rushing you because I don't want to have to be working on this truck on the weekend. Right, right. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift gears um, and we're going to, I want to dig into your mindset a little bit. Mm -hmm. Some of the things you've learned throughout the years. Um, what is one of the biggest hurdles? What's a big, the, one of the biggest challenges that you've had to overcome in your time at Western Hauler? Because people can look at the brand today and say, man, those Western Hauler guys got it going on. You know, they, they're really doing the deal. But I've got to think there was, it, it was a roller coaster at some point. There were some downs before there was some up. So can you talk about some of the hurdles that you've had to overcome while you're there? You know, our business is not like every business out there. You're going to have good times and bad. Anybody ever tells you they don't have bad times, they're either not doing something right or they're not doing something at all. <clears throat> you know, it, it, no one has good times all the time. Um, <clears throat> The main thing you got to do in, in, is you, when you have them bad times, learn from it. Mm -hmm. If you can learn and try not to have that ever happen again. Um, we get a lot of our trade-in trucks back. <clears throat> and um, first thing I do, I've got a guy that he details for us. He's worked for, he's worked for my father-in-law before Western Hall ever even was an idea. We call him old George. <clears throat> George is uh, almost 70 years old and still cleans up our trucks. Yeah, Comes yeah. to work every day. First thing we do, I call George and say, George, we got a trading truck. I have him clean it up. Then it goes in the shop <clears throat> and we personally go through it and look at it, see what's held up, what's not holding up, what we want to make different. Probably one of the biggest hurdles when we started building the hauler beds was trucks that we got back from up north. <clears throat> the environment up there is totally different than the environment here. Mm -hmm. You know, salt on the roads, you know, back then, you know, we, and I'm talking years ago, back in the, the early 90s, you know, we weren't undercoating, we weren't putting wire loom over wires, uh, <clears throat> we weren't soldering, you know. So when you start looking at where your product's weakest point is, and something I can truly, I can truly attest is, if there's a better way to do it, we want to know. Mm. I mean, we want to know. And we try to look at our product, <clears throat> see where the weak, you know, I don't even buy what they call scotch locks. They pinch wires together. They're quick, they're fast. We, we could cut our build time in half, but it doesn't last. It comes loose. Mm -hmm. I mean, I get a lot, <clears throat> we get a lot of people <clears throat> that first thing, <clears throat> some trailer manufacturers do is if there's a problem it's always the truck's fault <clears throat> you know oh truck's messed up truck messed up so we get lots of calls <clears throat> about they say the truck's messed up well <clears throat> we tell them with the check and most of the time now i'm not going to sit here and tell you the truck's never messed up right but most of the time it's a trailer and it's a scotch lock has come loose Huh. You know, our wires come loose or something like that. We actually solder all of our wires. <clears throat> uh, on our western hauler beds, we actually <clears throat> build the bed, take it apart before it goes through the automotive primer and paint. We, uh, we actually build the beds. Uh, we, uh, we primer them with a self-etching primer. <clears throat> then it comes to our shop. And we actually drill build the bed and take it apart before it goes to the automotive and paint. Wow. So there's not a bare spot on the bed. I mean, yeah. and that takes twice as long to build, but our customers have come to expect that quality. Yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, it's going back to your question, you know, what, what have you learned? And it's things like that we've learned, you know, back in the day when you, if you painted the bed, then you drilled everything and put it together where well, you got bare metal. It might look great for two years, but after three years, you start getting bubbling paint. Right. You know? Right. And uh, it, the thing is, is to, if you got a problem, figure it out, correct it, and go on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's so important, I think, too. It's how do we view those hurdles? How do we view those failures? Um, what lens are we looking at them through? Are we looking at them and beating ourselves up and judging ourselves, or are we looking at them in the sense like, how can I learn from this? How can I not do that different? I try to always look <clears throat> at my product the way my customers do. Uh -huh. 
you know, I tell the guys out in the shop all the time, I said, look, if you were buying this, just think about it, if you were buying it, because they'll say, man, we could shorten it up if we did this or that. And a lot of times they have good ideas, and sometimes I particularly don't care for it. And the best way I can explain to them, because the first thing somebody, when they work in, out in the, they were in the shop, they don't want to get shot down. I want them to come up with new ideas. Sure. But if, if I always end it like, if you were buying this, would you do it? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> And they can't ever argue with that. And it makes them proud in what they do also. Sure. And I want them to be. I mean, I, we have the best product out there. Yeah. And the only reason I do is because of them guys out in the shop. Right. You know, your product's only as good as who builds it. 100%. And that goes for anything. That anything. You do. <laughs> anything. Anything. Um, let's see here. Talk, talk to me a little bit about this. So I'm... I'm I'm a big routines guy, habits. Like I'm, I'm very conscious of my routines and what I'm doing, almost to a fault at times. But what is your routine like day to day? I know you said you, you and your father-in-law are going to breakfast every morning. I'd be curious to know what some of those conversations entail. And then like throughout the rest of your day, what does that look like? You know, we'll go to breakfast in the morning. We'll talk about what we got going on. If he's got some deliveries, if I've got some deliveries. Um, like this morning, I told him, I said, count me out this afternoon. I'm gonna be gone. Where you going? Yeah. Uh -huh. I explain to him. Now he's a he's 82 years old, so he's not up to speed on all this this new stuff. <laughs> he didn't have an Instagram. Yeah, no, no, no. Facebook, no Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, went over that. And, um, I had a delivery this morning at 8:30. Uh, text the customer, make sure they'd be there. Uh, they were there at 8:30. Got that truck delivered. We try to deliver trucks at the end of the week. Okay. You know we. It, um, beginning of the week, I don't like to deliver beginning of the week. We got a real stringent checkout procedure we do. Mm -hmm. My guys build the truck. <clears throat> we have a checkout sheet where whoever, let's just say fuel tank, um, <clears throat> it'll be highlighted on the work order. That whoever installs the fuel tank puts their initials by it. I see. And then uh, then once the truck's finished, it'll go through detail, yeah. go back to George. I see. Uh, go through detail, and then it goes through checkout. Right and I uh, got two guys, that's all they do is check trucks out. They'll go through that list, they'll check the fuel tank out, make sure it's working right, and make sure everything, all the bolts are tight and everything, then they'll put okay by it. Uh, the reason I do the initials, and all the guys at first, they get kind of like, well, I'm putting my initials. It's not, it's not for finding out if they did something wrong, it's for finding out if we figure out there's a better way of doing it and we change that way, I want to make sure they've realized it and we have changed uh, that way of uh -huh. doing it. And uh, it also enables where if, let's just say three months down the line, customer calls me and possibly maybe a wire come disconnected or come unsoldered, um, <clears throat> I can go back to who did it and just let them know, hey, when you're soldering, watch this. I you see. know, it's a great system. We've used it for years and years, and it's it's a really good. Ch you never can check enough. Mm -hmm. Just like the truck I delivered this morning, it's a repeat customer trading in a Western hauler, getting a Western hauler. We have a a box that we plug into the seven way mm -hmm. that lights up, <clears throat> and that's how we check our wiring to make sure it's right. It'll show left turn, right turn, brakes. Shows the amperage your brake control is putting out. Yeah. And uh, that way we can make sure everything's wired correctly. Well, I, I never know if the customer got a new trailer and they maybe the trailer might have been wired different. Mm -hmm. So I said, look, go out there and check their old truck with the box, make sure it's wired right. Mm -hmm. It takes two minutes, but think of the heartache it saved from the customer. If they go to hook up their trailer, they're at the horse show. They're gonna hook up before they leave. Last thing they wanna know is something's not wired right. 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 You know, so checkouts, checking is just something we do over and over and over. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, here's one. I, I, I ponder this question myself a lot. I like to journal and I write, write about this particular uh, topic around money. And I ask myself, what is my relationship with money? And I'm always asking that. So I'm curious to know. Um, what is your relationship with money? It was something we need to survive and we get used to these certain lifestyles, but what, I'm just curious to know your input or your thoughts. So what is your relationship with money? 
you know, Mike, I, I grew up, <clears throat> you know, at the time you grew up, you don't think you have a whole lot, <clears throat> you know? And I'm not saying uh, we weren't poor by no means, but, you know, <clears throat> my, uh, my, first, my first vehicle was my grandpa's truck that got passed down to my dad, then I got it, <clears throat> you know? And I was super grateful to have it. I was proud to have a 66 Chevy. <laughs> Hell yeah. You know, three speed on the column. Um, so I didn't really grow up. Um, now, as I got older, I realized I was very, I grew up very, very wealthy with love and, mm -hmm. and um, love and experience. You know, I was, I had so much, I'm trying to think of the right way to describe this. And everybody has this, but it's up to the individual to take advantage of it. I had so many things thrown in front of me that I took advantage of, how to learn. You know, when my grandfather and my dad was working on a tractor, I wanted to be there. I wanted to learn, okay, <clears throat> how does this work? Why does this do this? You know, and thank goodness they took the time to show me, <clears throat> you know. Um, Melly and I have a daughter, <clears throat> and she's 25 years old. And when she was young, I, I um, maintain all the tractors, the lawnmowers. I fix everything on the ranch. And I just, I, I just love doing it. And so at night, I go in the shop where Western Hauler started. Where earlier, I told you it started in that shop on right. the ranch. Well, that's my shop. That's where I tinker at. My daughter wanted to come out there with me. She's three or four years old. <clears throat> And I'd be doing something. What are you doing, Dad? And I, I, I it was so, it was like, oh, God. But I thought, I thought back, you know what? <clears throat> your grandpa and your dad stopped and showed you. Mm -hmm. And I stopped, and I'd show her. And she, well, can I get a screwdriver? So I'd have to stop, get her something. But you know what? <clears throat> We're losing that today, and we need to get that back. Because there's so many experiences like that that... And I keep going back to your very first question <clears throat> about what did they see in you? You know, if maybe if I didn't have all that exposed to me and people didn't take the time with me, I wouldn't have had that to show to somebody what I had in me that has affected my life. You know, <clears throat> and going back to your money deal, you know, I was 30 years old. <clears throat> and I remember, you know, uh, <clears throat> I'm not a religious person by no means but I I am religious inside of myself I get so much by going in my back pasture and sitting on the fence <clears throat> and looking at the wildlife looking at my cows just looking at what God created that's my church and uh, yeah. I sit back there and I remember when I was 30 years old and I looked up in the sky and I thanked him I said you know I'm 30 years old and I have more than I could ever dreamed I would have in life at 30 years old. I, and I asked him, I said, where, where do I go from here? What, 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 is, what is it from here? And it's funny how you go through the trimesters in your life and the trimester I'm in now, it's, it's not about me, it's about, <clears throat> I mean, I never thought I could love my wife more now than I did when I first married her, but it's, I just, I, doesn't that day goes by, I appreciate her more. The older I get, I appreciate her more. And you know, money is not as important as it used to be. It's, it's, it's family, it's friends, it's, it's the quality of my product. You know, I treat my customers as their friends, yeah. you know, and if something's not right, it really bothers me. Yeah. It does, it bothers me. I want it to be, I want it to be perfect. I want it to be the best experience to have. There's something I hear that makes me know I'm doing it right, and I hear it all the time. Is a first time customer, when they're sitting at my desk, I'm delivered the truck, and we've done everything, and they look at me and say, this is the easiest truck I've ever bought in my life. And that's when I know I've done it right. Yeah. When I quit hearing that, I gotta back up and say, okay, what, something's yeah. not right. But I absolutely love what I do. Yeah. I love what I do. That's awesome, that was a, a beautiful explanation. Um, and yeah, f focusing on those experiences and realizing it and having the gratitude for each one of those times and, and going back to what you said about like what's next, like there is no destination. Like, yeah, you were 30 and you 
may have been, you know, at a, a pretty high level, but the destination, the journey is the destination. It like, is. It, it never it is. ends. It is. You know, and um, Randy and I were having a similar conversation yesterday. And that's something I naively thought you could attain. Like you could get to this place, this destination, and then you can just kind of quit no. everything you've been doing. No, it really doesn't. Spoiler alert, there is no yeah. such place, you know? Yeah. So that's validating to hear you say. Um, in, the journey, in the journey, Mike, the journey is what you make of it. Mm -hmm. it it's, it's, not, it's not what anybody else makes of it, it's what you make of it. Right. You know, driving down the road, <clears throat> I love going on roads I've never been on before. Just to see what the country's like, see if I see a different type of wildlife or something, you know? And <clears throat> I hate to say this, I'm looking off to the side of the road more. I'm looking at the road on the new road I've been on just to see the country, just see, sure. is there something out there I hadn't seen before, Yeah. you know? So I'm looking forward to that new journey all the time, you know? And, and I think people need to get that in their mind. Don't just, oh, this is just an old road again. Right. It's not, it's a new road. See if they can find something out of it that you hadn't seen before. Yeah. You know, I look forward to new things. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, this is a question I ask just about on every show. It's, it's a hypothetical. And um, if you could go back in time, mm -hmm. um, and give your 20 year old self advice with the wisdom that you have today. It sounded like you're pretty savvy at 20, um, so I'm curious to hear what you would tell yourself, but if you could go back in time with the knowledge you have today, what advice do you give to the 20 year old Larry Roberts? When I was 20, <clears throat> I wasn't in Texas yet. <clears throat> I was still in, in Louisiana. <clears throat> you know, I don't, I don't, something I usually don't say, I know I'm, I know I'm very public right now, but um, I've had some things happen in my life that they've been really tough, but they've been, they've made me who I am today. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> when I was 18, I, uh, my mom and dad got divorced. And I had, like I said earlier, I had four siblings under me. And uh, <clears throat> I actually uh, didn't go to college, was going to go, was plan my plans were, but my mom asked me back then, 1980, there wasn't child support, wasn't hardly anything. And she said, would you help me? <clears throat> and uh, I said, yes, ma'am, I will. And uh, I was 18 years old, <clears throat> and I was taking care of my mom and four siblings that were younger than me. And um, so at 20, I was still doing that, <clears throat> and I was working for the gentleman. At 20, I was, uh, I was doing diesel mechanic work on crew boats. And, uh, doing the best I could do, loving what I did. There's more satisfaction, I got more satisfaction out of going to a piece of machine that I was broke, <clears throat> wouldn't run, and then I'd leave and it sounded like it was brand new. Yeah. I got so much satisfaction. But you know, I guess I'd go back, if I go back to when I was 20, <clears throat> and I would look at myself and say, <clears throat> do exactly what you're doing. Because I have, I have no regrets. Yeah. I, I mean, every, every decision, I've been very fortunate. I, I don't. I, there's not a decision I would have. I made some. I've made some wrong decisions, but earlier we talked about my wrong decisions. I learned from. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I can't say that they were a mistake because maybe if I didn't make that mistake, I wouldn't be where I am today. Yeah. So I would just say, do what you're doing. Yeah. Don't 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 change anything because where I'm at in life today is is I couldn't be any more happier or I wouldn't change anything about it. Yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to change anything at 20. Yeah, I love that. I love that and I agree, like everything happens just as it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. Yep. Whether we agree with it or it, it, whether it lines up with our agenda at that time. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. I might have, you know, you know what I might, I might tell myself? Tell Wayne, tell Wayne maybe five or six times no <laughs> he, might, he, might have, he might have made a little more money. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, what is one of the, the best or most worthwhile investments that you've ever made? And that could be money, that could be investment of time, energy. What is one of the best investments you've ever made? Gosh, that's a really good question. That's something I've never really thought of, <clears throat> you know, and... Uh, as you can tell, when you ask me a question, I do try to answer it. 
Oh yeah, tr- very very truthful. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, my best you, my best investment I've made is that basically what you're asking me? Yeah. My best investment I've made in my life is something that's I think is going to be here, and that would be my daughter. <clears throat> the time I've spent with my daughter, um, <clears throat> the what I've done and what I continue to do for her, I, I look at it as an investment. I mean, she's 25. Mm-hmm. My, her her mom and I and her grandparents, we all still help her, and I I don't look at that as as um, <clears throat> as supporting her. I just look at that as an investment mm-hmm. for her for her future. Um, I think that's what we leave behind, and our legacy is our is our kids, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and you know, the business too. I mean, Western haulers like your kid also. I mean, right. I didn't create it; Wayne created it. But he is passed it. You know, he's passing it on to me. So I'm gonna treat it like his 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 child. So I mean, I, you know, the business. Because without the business, I can't do the rest of everything. Right. You know, I can't can't ever lose focus of what affords you to do what you love to do. And that's yeah. your business. So uh, you have to treat it like a investment also. So I'd have to say my, my daughter and my business, Western Holler. That's great. That's great. Um, if you had, uh, if, so I want to know what advice do you have for a, maybe a kid that just got out of college or a young kid maybe wanting to start a business um, wondering if they should or if they should go to school and get a, a job like but they really want to do this entrepreneur thing and they want to start a business what is your advice to that to that young kid you know that the NSBA I don't know if you know them the National Snaffle Bit Association okay. <clears throat> really good organization they started a program <clears throat> called the uh, the young trainers program and uh, they asked me to go speak for this very this very deal about you know someone that owned a business that they took they took 15 young horse trainers mm-hmm. and they set up a deal for them so they could learn more of business more about accounting more about different things other than training a horse right and a really good program but the only problem it hit right when COVID hit right. <clears throat> so it kind of got dismantled and we did have one session and 90 uh, percent of the people that was their question they asked me <clears throat> the young trainers uh, what advice you give us. <clears throat> and you know what I've what's worked for me I'm not going to say what I'm going to tell you is going to work for you everyone's different but what's worked for me is and the number one thing that I have done that I think that has helped me is honesty <clears throat> is being honest if you and being honest is not honest just honest with someone else but honest with yourself also sure because if you're honest with yourself and you're honest, people will see that, <clears throat> you know. And then honesty is going to work in all kind of different means. Honesty works well. Honestly, do I need to go buy this new pair of boots? You know, it goes from spending money. Mm-hmm. It's honesty is more than just telling someone the truth. Yeah. And that's why I go back. Be honest with yourself. You yeah. know, do you really need a new saddle right now? You know, or do I need to go buy some hay? Yeah. You know, in in honesty, that's going to be. I've tried to be honest with myself and towards other people, and I think that's that's been a very successful attribute to myself through my life. I saw a quote the other day. I think McConaughey may have said it. Everybody want everybody wants to hear the truth unless it's about them. Mm-hmm. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But it is. It's one of those. It's like a, a constant practice. You know, it you is. have to constantly be asking yourself, "Am I being honest mm-hmm. with myself? Exactly, you know, and with others." I want to talk a little bit about, or I want to hear your hear you talk a little bit about the the community, this Western lifestyle, and some of the folks that you've been able to meet along the way. You know, and and I'll start with with um, Mr. Randy Bloomer since we mm-hmm. sat down with him yesterday and we were talking a little bit here before we got going and how important that is to have those people because it seems like it's a win-win relationship. You know, it's a great relationship. <clears throat> and it goes back, <clears throat> it's funny how people with the same passion for their business um, 
going back to what you asked me, what I what I contribute most, and I, I I told you being honest, being truthful. You know, people that have the same wants and goals and philosophy, they they tend to. Uh, it's kind of like when you put a bunch of cattle in a pen and you start sorting cattle. <clears throat> The hot cow always ends up being the last one in the pen when you when you're sorting them. Uh-huh. He says it's funny how people with the right, the same passion, the same thoughts, they end up becoming friends, becoming business acquaintances. You do business with people like that. And it's funny, you know, I gosh, I've been so very fortunate <clears throat> in our business. You know, Wayne started this business back in 1982. <clears throat> No one else was doing it. And he started an industry. He really did. Now, I'm going to say, I'm trying to remember, and I base everything, I hate to keep going back to the Congress, but the Congress is the largest equine Mm -hmm. event in the world. You know, so it's where more, the biggest trade show is. So you kind of gauge off of that trade show. And there have been so many conversion companies come into business and go out of business through the years right. and <clears throat> Wayne and I one of our conversations we talk about at breakfast in the vehicle is how proud I we are and and I gotta give him credit he's the first to start and still in business and you know to, to, to go through all those ups and downs through all them years and to still be <clears throat> the number one the yeah. top of the game. I mean, that's just that, that's, that's phenomenal. It's something that that I'm so proud of him about. You know, right. I mean, if he was here, he, he'd say it's us. But you yeah. know, that's just how he is. But I'm gonna point your finger. He started it. I didn't start it. Right. So my goal is to, you know, make it better <clears throat> than what he has. That's a tough deal to do. Yeah. But you know, but that that's the goal. And it goes back. You mentioned Randy earlier. You know. I send people to Randy. Randy sends customers to me. And when Randy sends me a customer, <clears throat> I got a lot of pressure because not only am I representing myself in Western Holler, I'm representing Randy at that point in time also. Right. So I have to work even harder. So, uh, and Randy does the same for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's, uh, I, I'm, I'm real proud to call him a friend. I yeah. mean, and uh, he really is. He's a good guy. But, uh, we take for granted in our industry who we get to meet, who we get to do business with, who we become friends with. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's just amazing who we meet. We, uh, actually, I take it for granted sometimes. I'll talk to friends back home <clears throat> that aren't involved in the business, and they'll be talking about something, and I'll say, yeah, yeah, I know so-and-so, and it, it just blows their mind. <laughs> you mean you know that person? Yeah. I said, yeah. I said, you know, um, <clears throat> a really neat story. This happened years ago. We had a very, very prominent baseball player that played for the Rangers, and um, not an equine guy. I don't know if he'd know front end from the back end of a horse. And uh, <clears throat> his name was uh, his name. They called him was Pudge Rodriguez. Oh yeah. But his real name was Ivan Rodriguez. Right. <clears throat> and when I first met him, he. Uh, one of the first things he instilled in me was, he said, Larry, they call me Pudge, but my friends call me Ivan. <clears throat> yeah, so, that's awesome. Make a long story short, <clears throat> he, has, uh, he had offshore racing boats, and he wanted to buy a truck to pull his offshore racing boats. And uh, became very good friends with, Pud- with Ivan. He was a really good guy. He got traded off. I hated that. Yeah. And, and, uh, he was, man, he was one of my heroes because yeah. I was a catcher back in the day. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Coming up and yeah, he was legit. <laughs> Genuinely first class guy. That's good um, to hear. He, uh, I don't know if you remember, he was throwing a guy out at second and he broke his thumb. He hit the bat. He hit the bat, you, yeah. You remember that? Yeah, oh yeah. Well, his orthopedic was in full worth. Mm. <clears throat> and when during that deal, he, he had to stay home. He couldn't go anywhere. Right. Well, I was building a truck at that time for him. A Peterbilt, actually, a big truck. Yeah. And uh, he would come by the shop, and he would, uh, hey, can I sit out in the shop and watch him work on my truck? Really? And he would get a chair and sit out in the shop. None of my guys ever asked him for an autograph, never bugged him, and he felt so comfortable there. And, just uh, hang out. Just hang out. He'd come there and just hang out and watch yeah, him build awesome. his truck. That's awesome. Watch him build his truck. 
Very cool. Very cool. Well, Mr. Larry, I'm going to roll into what we call the slow fire round. And it is brought to you by Ghostwood Distilling Company. And um, it's only going to be about five questions. Sure. Um, so is there a book that you gift most often to other people or that maybe that you reread most often? You know, I don't really gift the book. Um, I'm not really one to instill my thoughts on someone else, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I would never want someone to think that. <clears throat> but there's a book that a, a customer and a friend of mine wrote, <clears throat> and uh, he's Cutter. His name's Mel Blunt. Mel Blunt. Yep. Played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And it's called The Burning Cross. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, Mel wrote it himself, and it's a very, very good book. <clears throat> I would recommend someone if they wanted to read a good book to read it. There you go. If you could go back to any time period, this can be any time period, not just your lifetime, mm -hmm. um, for one week and live, um, wh wh when would that be and why? <clears throat> you know, I would, I'm a hist I love history. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, you always think, what era would you like to have lived in? Sure. You know, <clears throat> I wouldn't want to change my life at all. Right. You know, but, I would, I would like to have lived in a simpler time, you know, where you didn't have to go buy a seventy, eighty thousand dollar truck, you know, uh -huh. where you know where what you got was what you put into it. Right. So I would say I would like to go back to the, you know, the eighteen nineties, you know, that yeah. time period, you know, yeah. where it was a simpler time you know where you you know you built the garden if you run a bunch of cows if you spent more time then your family got to eat more yeah you know where you didn't wasn't as dependent yeah on other people you know and uh i think that would be a time that i would like to go back to yeah i love it uh, my answer is similar i would say 1850 ish i don't know if i'd survive the whole week the whole week <laughs> right that, right just for the same reason though because it is just a simpler time yeah you yep. Know. You know, family was a big deal back then. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I say that, I hesitate when I, after I said that, I don't know that it was simpler. It's simpler compared to what I know now here in this, you know, 2021 mm -hmm. with all of the technologies and the comfortabilities that we have. Yes. But I don't know. Sometimes I, that's kind of where I go sometimes. I'll just leave the phone at home and go out and try <clears throat> to live like I did, they did back then. You know, you know I got a place that I lease down south of Sonora. <clears throat> And uh, the phone service, you can only get phone service on top of the hill. Right. And that, that's... I've been to those places. Where I go to relax. Yeah. You know, a funny story, when I first came to work for Wayne, when I was doing the breeding, we didn't have cell phones back then. Right. But you had beepers. Oh, yeah. And he gave me a beeper. <clears throat> and um, that beeper go off, he wanted me to go call him. And uh, <clears throat> he's going to find the truth out now. But... <laughs> I told him I lost the beeper, I threw it in the creek. <laughs> <laughs> Just about the time I'd be on a horse or doing something, getting something done, that dang beeper would go off. Yeah. <clears throat> so I got tired of it and I thought, you know, this, I'm, not, I'm not as productive with this beeper having to stop. Yeah. You know? How long did it take um, you owning that or having that beeper till you threw it in the creek? It's about a month. Yeah. <clears throat> Wasn't very long. It's about a month. <laughs> and I think he really knew what I did with it because he didn't give me another one. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> uh, he didn't give me another one. <laughs> um, what is one thing that you wish you were better at? And, and I got to ask that because I feel like a man who has done what you've done, you're constantly trying to improve, right? And um, so what is one thing that you wish you were better, better at doing? <clears throat> You know, I can say this with a lot of confidence because I, I, I have to try at this, <clears throat> and, I, and, I, and I need to do a better job at it. <clears throat> I'm a great listener with everyone but my immediate family. Mm. <clears throat> you know, my, <clears throat> my youngest brother <clears throat> um, used to work for me. He, uh, he's a graduate of Talton. Um, when I told you earlier that I raised my family when I was 18. Well, <clears throat> my youngest sibling was still in school and, and uh, he was in junior high when I moved to Texas. Well, <clears throat> I moved him over here with me. So I raised my youngest sibling, my youngest brother. 
And uh, <clears throat> my wife, kudos to her, we're newlyweds and got a 16 year old. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so she's a special person. Sounds and, like it. And uh, so uh, my brother, we're still, he's, I'm very, very close with him. Um, <clears throat> kudos to Wayne, my father-in-law and mother-in-law, because we live on the same ranch and everything. Right. I mean, they were, they, they took care of my little brother like he was part of theirs. Yeah. You know, so we're still really close. He graduated from Talton. Uh, worked for me for a little while. Um, <clears throat> the big brother, little brother deal yeah. wasn't the best, but he actually, it's funny how things work. Where he's at now, he's it's fantastic. Um, Wayne and I bought a place across the street from us in Burleson at the ranch, and it had a house on it, and we bought it for the land, for Hayfield. And um, <clears throat> Adam, my youngest brother, he lives in the house with his wife and his little boy. So I'm really close. and. <clears throat> And I'm going back to your question, where I would like to change. I get short with immediate family, mm -hmm. which Adam with my wife, yeah. it's, and I, I don't want to be that way. You know, they'll ask me a question and I'll answer it not the way I should. Right. And I don't think you're alone in that, though. Yeah, I know, but but I realize it after you answer or after the question, you you walk off and you say I shouldn't have said it like that. Right. That's that's where I that's where I want to improve, and my and, and my my wife always says, and she, and she brings it to my attention, and uh, and I, and I do I try, but I need to try harder. Right on. Well, well, Mr. Larry, that's all I have for you, my friend. I, uh, I again, time is our most valuable asset, so I appreciate you sharing yours with me today, and um, I did say we would I would um, get into like what is next for Western haulers, so. Uh, I'll take this time, let people know where they can find out about Western Hauler, what yeah, the website you, is, and then what you guys may have coming in the pipeline. You know, we've got a website like everybody. It's www.westernhauler.com. <clears throat> or, like I tell people, pick up the phone and call. We do not have an answering machine. Mm. If a live person doesn't answer, <clears throat> then something's wrong. <laughs> yeah, we we will never never ever have automated answering so you can call you can call Western Holler and just ask for yourself. We'll be more than glad. Myself, I have some great, great people there that are spending their time with you, talk to you, ask for me. I'm always there. Very cool. Well thank you again, my friend. I've enjoyed it. It's been a great, great experience. Perfect. Perfect.